To die from overwork is not something that happens very often nowadays, but in the early days of our church, it seemed to happen on a frequent basis. Coupled with little information on what a good nutritious diet consisted of, as well as poor vaccination, the graves of Mount Hope Cemetery here have too many young people who died early, yet whose impact lasts far beyond their short years on earth. The story of the Andrews family is particularly sad. His wife, Angeline, died at the age of 48, two years before he left the US to be a missionary in Europe. They had a close and loving relationship and the separation that his travel caused was not easy. Separation in death though was even harder and he moved from Rochester, New York to Lancaster, Massachusetts and continued his work there. Unfortunately, his daughter Mary, who had been his backbone of support, contracted tuberculosis and the prognosis didn't look good. He took her back to the United States, to Battle Creek, where he had Dr. Kellogg look at her. Unfortunately, nothing could be done to heal her. And despite the advice from Dr. Kellogg, Jay and Andrews insisted on spending almost every day with his daughter. She had been his support while he was in Europe after his wife Angeline had died and he refused to leave her side in her dying days. Dr. Kellogg warned that by proximity to his daughter he might contract tuberculosis but he was loyal right up until the end. Jay and Andrews did contract tuberculosis from his daughter and died way too young at just 54 years old and is buried here in Basel, Switzerland. One can only wonder what impact he would have had on the church if he lived for 30 years longer, or how the outcome of the 1888 General Conference session might have been different if he was there. During the course of his life, James White held the position of the editor of Review and Herald as well as General Conference President, amongst other things. He did the work not of one man, but at least two, if not three. From his younger years working on the railroad and cutting grass by hand to working tirelessly for the church. He died 34 years before his wife in 1881 and is buried here in the Oak Hill Cemetery in Battle Creek. Nathaniel and Anna White, siblings of James White, worked here in Rochester for a few years, but both died young in their early 20s from tuberculosis. Jay and Andrew's other child, Carrie, is also buried here, along with the Orton family. It was the Ortons who prayed for James White's recovery in 1865, and it was in the home of their daughter, where Ellen White had her Christmas Day vision that led to the establishment of the first Seventh-day Adventist sanitarium. Here lie the graves, predominantly of young people. Young people in their teens and 20s who dedicated their lives to a message, to a belief that the world needed to hear the truth of a crucified, risen, and soon to come savior. Young people who took their faith seriously. Young people who sacrificed and dedicated their lives more than any others had. To pioneer a new work takes a lot more effort and sacrifice than to just keep it running. And these young people sacrificed in the early years and pushed God's work forward. May we examine our lives and see where we can commit and dedicate more to finish this work. The movement had focused on Christ from the beginning. The early Advent believers asked the question, when is Jesus coming? However, after the great disappointment of 1844, they then moved on to ask the question, what is he doing? By the early 1880s though, the church had lost sight of Christ and had failed to make him the center of its doctrines. A spirit of debating had settled in and they were winning people over to the church more through debating and a theoretical ascent of knowledge rather than by emphasizing heart change. The 1888 General Conference session 
is the most famous GC session in our history, but unfortunately it's remembered for negative reasons, with the questions often being framed, what if? It was held here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, from October the 17th to November the 4th, and it was the 27th session held. It was held in the newly constructed Adventist Church that was located on the northwest corner of the intersection behind me. At the time, world membership was 27,000 and there were 90 delegates present, small by today's standards. Mission work in the South Pacific, city evangelism, amongst other ordinary matters were discussed, but no one remembers these. Ellen White later commented, I have been instructed by God that the terrible experience at the Minneapolis conference is one of the saddest chapters in the history of the believers of present truth. Prior to the GC session, the theological tension had been building with articles being published by both sides, something that Ellen White spoke very strongly against. Also at the various camp meetings, different presentations were given and a spirit of opposition, debate and bitterness was aroused. However, this would come to a head here in Minneapolis. The principal characters at this GC session were A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner, both in their 30s, and Uriah Smith and G.I. Butler, both in their 50s. As the two younger men presented their messages of righteousness by faith, they were met with opposition. They were presenting on the importance of the centrality of the cross and of Christ's righteousness and the importance of seeing the law in its correct context. However, one of the arguments that they used to show this was that the law in Galatians 3 was the ceremonial law and not the moral law. This was met with stiff opposition as some thought that the teaching of the Sabbath was under threat and would lead to misinterpretation and misunderstanding from other denominations. They were invited to debate, and although this practice was common at the time, they refused to. They hadn't come to do that. A rebuttal presentation was made, but the only response at the next session was to read Bible passages in turn on the love of God. No explanation given, just the Bible read. The impact was profound. Many were impacted by the messages with S.N. Haskell and J.O. Corliss being two of them. The following year, revivals would take place all over the United States of America with Ellen White Jones and Wagner leading out, one of which took place in South Lancaster, Massachusetts. Commenting later on, Ellen White said, I have never seen a revival go forward with such thoroughness and yet remain so free of undue excitement. A few years later, Uriah Smith would apologize to Ellen White for how he had responded and would also make a public apology in the Dime Tabernacle in Battle Creek. Not an easy thing to do. One of the sad outcomes of 1888 is that the principal presenters of Jones and Wagner would eventually end up apostatizing and leaving the church. The reasons for this are many and cannot be adequately explained in a few minutes. Some of the responsibility rests with them for not letting the message completely change their own hearts. Yet some blame must be apportioned to the brethren who so strongly and bitterly oppose them. This opposition would become a difficult and overmastering temptation to the young messengers. And whilst this does not excuse their departure, it does give us some understanding. A key lesson that we didn't learn in 1888 and that we still struggle with today is how to be a Christian whilst in conflict with someone else. How do you show Christ-like love when the person that you're discussing or debating with has a vastly different viewpoint to you and or may be treating you wrongly. May we learn to be graceful with those we disagree with in the conflicts that we have today. The church would move on over time and realize the issue that was debated wasn't of the magnitude that people thought it was at the time. So often we major in minors, 
Ellen White would say many times that the law in Galatians wasn't a major issue and that the church shouldn't make it so. Today it's easy to get sidetracked on other issues and miss the bigger picture. Jones and Wagner were some great preachers, some of the brightest minds that our church has seen and yet ultimately they lost sight of Jesus. Today we need to be careful that we don't follow men but that we follow God's word and the message that is contained there. It wasn't the message that was at fault but it was the attitude and spirit of those involved on both sides. The message that they gave will need to be given again and God will raise up other people who will overcome where they failed. May we be part of sharing the beautiful message of the love of God and the righteousness of Christ to the world. Stephen Haskell was born in the year 1833 in Oakham, Massachusetts and would go on to have a huge impact on the world church. He was converted at the age of 15 and a few years later he would marry his first wife, Mary. At the age of 19, he heard the message of Jesus soon return and started to tell everyone about this. One day while he was talking to a friend, he was encouraged that he should start preaching himself. At the time, he was a professional soap maker, but he started to preach and was known as being able to comprise sound, logical, and powerful sermons. In 1853, he attended a camp meeting in Winstead, Connecticut, after which he decided to travel through Canada. On his way, he stopped in Springfield, Massachusetts, where he met William Saxby, a tinsmith who introduced him to the Sabbath. Despite being initially opposed to it, he listened to him, and after studying it out, he realized that it was biblical and committed to keeping it. A visit later on with Joseph Bates would further solidify this decision that he had made. By now he was living here in South Lancaster and was active in ministering to the believers in the area, keeping accurate records of the Sabbath schools, churches and members. In 1868, he handed a copy of this report to James White. He showed J.H. Wagner and J.N. Andrews and so impressed were they by his abilities that they ordained him as a minister, formed a New England conference and appointed him as the first president. He was 37 years old at the time. Another initiative that he started during his time here in South Lancaster was the Vigilant Missionary Society. They started by writing letters of encouragement, lending books and papers, and praying for people. Over time, this small society would grow and flourish until it became the ABC or Adventist Book Center as we know it today. S.N. Haskell was a decisive and organized leader and served as the president here in New England whilst also being president in California and president of the main conference for a time as well. While he was president here in New England, he saw the forming of the South Lancaster Academy, which would go on to become the Atlantic Union College. Standing behind me is Founders Hall, built in 1884, the oldest original Adventist school building. Stephen Haskell would be instrumental in the start of the work in Australia and New Zealand, spending 13 months there. Whilst he was away traveling, his wife Mary would stay at home. She was a committed Christian and bore her physical pain with patience. Later on, she and Stephen would move here to California where she is buried. Writing in Ellen White, Stephen said, I loved her and she loved me, in capital letters, as if to emphasize the point. The Lord would provide another wife for Stephen, Hetty Hurd. She was a pioneering type of woman whom he had met several times and was an active missionary having spent time in England, Africa and California. 
They would get married in Australia in 1897 and would go on to start a training school in New York City before later moving to California where they were instrumental in the start of the health work here. Later on they would move to Nashville, Tennessee and it was whilst there that they heard the sad news that Ellen White had passed away. Essen Haskell had previously been asked to share the message at her funeral and delivered a message of hope and triumph. As he reached his final years, he once commented to his wife that he was frustrated that he couldn't do more in life. She told him that whereas he used to travel and preach, now his printed sermons went to places that he never could. He lies buried here in California next to his first wife, Mary, because he told the brethren that when he died, to bury him next to whichever wife was closest. Years earlier at his ordination, James White had told him, always look to God rather than man for direction in your work. May we do the same, to look to God rather than our fellow man for our directions in God's work. When Jay and Andrews arrived in England in 1874 on his way to Switzerland, he didn't find any Adventist converts. There was one Adventist English family, but they had emigrated before he arrived. In 1878, English-born William Ings, who himself had emigrated to America, arrived here in Southampton for a two-week stay to visit his relatives and also to evangelize. He passed out some literature while he was here and was able to convince two people to keep the Sabbath. His next visit in 1878 would prove more fruitful and in May of that year, they sent a request to the General Conference to send a minister over. In June of that year, the General Conference voted to send the experienced pioneer and administrator, J.N. Loughborough. Southampton was one of the cities that the Mayflower left from on its way to America and it would prove the birthplace of the Adventist church here in Britain. J.N. Loughborough found the work here both different and more difficult than in America. He held a series of meetings in an area near where the present Seventh-day Adventist church is and his opening crowd of 150 dwindled quickly. After 255 meetings in December of 1879, he did not have a single baptism, though he did have a Sabbath school with 17 members. The work was hard and the challenges were multiple, but they pressed on. In January of 1880, the newly formed Tract and Missionary Society began sending signs of the times to libraries and interested people. By February of that year, 13 people were baptized in Southampton, and by 1883, the first Adventist church was formed in Britain with 19 founding members. By the end of 1883, there were 65 members in Britain, and by 1887, there were 122. The headquarters of the church in Britain, with the staff and the printing press, would move to Grimsby, a house there on the North Sea coast, and by 1884, two churches would be formed in Grimsby and Ulserby. This building behind me is the first Seventh-day Adventist built and owned church in the British Isles and was dedicated in 1889. Essen Haskell would come over and take over the leadership of the church in Britain and move the headquarters from the relative obscurity of Grimsby down to London. In London, using a house as their base, they began to train local people and continued with aggressive literature evangelism. In June of that year, they baptized nearly 20 people. Judson Washburn would further develop the evangelistic work in England with an emphasis on literature evangelism, Christ-centered preaching and musical singing groups. He held audiences of up to 1,000 people and in the town of Bath, baptized nearly 80 people. In 1902, 
The British Union was formed with three missions and two conferences, a newly formed college and a health food factory. In 1907, the three institutions, along with the British Union headquarters, were relocated to the 25 hectare Stambra Park, which still serves as the headquarters of the British Union to this day. Even though church membership increased by 20% through the war, World War I would prove a huge test to the young church as the challenge of conscription was faced. Some were able to serve as conscientious objectors, but others were less fortunate and were imprisoned and tortured for refusing to compromise their faith. This memorial stands here as a testament to their faith under fire and in recognition of the sacrifice that they and their families made. Even though the work progressed relatively slowly here in Britain with quite a few challenges early on, workers from the British Union and graduates from Newborough College here would prove quite influential in world missions, serving as missionaries in Africa and India amongst other places. Through dedication and commitment, the work moved on. As in other parts of the world, there has never been a glory era of evangelism, but the commission is to go into all the world, no matter how easy or hard the work may be. If you are living and working for Christ today in an area and you are not getting the success that you hoped or dreamed of, then I want to encourage you to stay faithful at your duty. For God rewards us not according to our seeming success, but according to the spirit in which the work is done. How do you know when you are called to do something or go somewhere? How do you decide if something is the right thing to do? Do you always know in black and white which path to take or which way to go in life? Or is it sometimes less clear? Does God leave some of the decision making to us? Ellen White's call and subsequent trip to Australia illustrates in many ways the challenges that we face in seeking God's will as she faced these two. In 1891, the General Conference officers sent an urgent request to Ellen White to spend some time in the new field of Australia. They felt it would be a great blessing, and if she had light in this direction, she was invited to set sail that same autumn. She prayed for weeks for guidance and direction, but nothing was forthcoming. She was willing to go, even though it was a great sacrifice, as long as she knew that it was the will of God. But despite her prayers, she only heard silence. She said, I have not special light to leave America for this far off country. Nevertheless, if I knew it was the voice of God, I would go. She had no light either way. In the absence of any clear light either way, rather than delay, she decided to go. Some have viewed her call to Australia as the result of politically orchestrated circumstances, but Ellen White never got entangled in such debates. She later said to her son Edson that she came in submission to the office of the General Conference, which I have ever maintained to be authority. This decision would prove a huge blessing to the work here in Australia, New Zealand and the South Pacific, a blessing they are still reaping the rewards of today. Not every decision we make does God have to spell out clearly, and action is better than delay. Ellen White moved forward and during her time here in Australia, they would establish a sanitarium and later a hospital, a publishing house, a health food company, a college, all of which would grow rapidly over time. When Ellen White arrived in Australia, she was soon sick with rheumatic fever for about eight months. She was in pain and was in bed for a long time. Despite her pain, she would continue to write in bed, but it got worse and worse 
and it got to a point where they had to move her every two hours so as to lessen the pain. Eventually, she asked to be anointed and afterwards she said that she was relieved but not restored but content to wait for the Lord to work on her behalf. During this time, while lying on her back in bed, she spent a lot of time in prayer and later on said that she wouldn't exchange this experience for anything in the world. It was during this time that Jesus became a friend more dear than before. And one of the results of this experience was the writing of the book, The Desire of Ages, later on during her time here. Sometimes God was very explicit with how he led Ellen White and at other times he was less direct. Sometimes he was quiet and she would have to figure it out. If this was how God led a prophet, then we cannot expect him to be more prescriptive in our lives today. Not every decision we make does he spell out exactly for us. And oftentimes he expects us to use our minds to reason as we come to a decision. God leads us in many ways, primarily through his word, through the wise counsel of friends and through providential circumstances. Knowing God's will is a constant struggle and challenge that we face at the many stages in life that we go through. I pray that as you seek God's will in your life, in the decisions that you have to make, whether to go into ministry or not, what occupation to have, where to live, whom to marry, that as you seek his will, you may move forward decisively.